When debates about the greatest fighters of World War II pop up, raw performance is usually the primary yardstick. In spite of being considered inferior, the P-40 earned every bit of its fame. Of all the Allied fighters leading Japanese Navy ace Saburo Sakai faced in 1942, he considered a well-handled P-40 to be among the most formidable. If for nothing else, the Curtis P-40 will forever be remembered as the mount of Claire Chenault's Flying Tigers. In spite of being surpassed by other fighters as World War II went on, the Allison-powered Hawk series became America's symbol of determination to beat a tenacious enemy as the Spitfire was to the British. American volunteer group aces like R.T. Smith fought against overwhelming odds to rack up the greatest kill-to-loss ratio in history, even though they were supposed to be flying a fighter that would not maneuver with a Japanese Zero and Oscar. Chenault relied on training and the strong points of the P-40. High diving speed, rugged construction, excellent firepower. Tucked away on this beautiful 90-acre grass airstrip in Geneseo, New York, south of Rochester, the National Warplane Museum serves as home for this P-40E on permanent loan from Dr. Bill Anderson. There's nothing in sight here to break the spell of this being a wartime strip. With a growing membership and an air show every August, which attracts over 100,000 people, the museum flies a B-17, an A-26 Invader, a PBY Catalina, and a variety of other warbirds. Slowly, wartime-style buildings will go up to house the collection in an authentic atmosphere. Every time I look at the shark mouth on a P-40, I get a genuine thrill. This combination is legendary. To get the opportunity to climb in and fly it is a very rare privilege. Thanks to Austin Wadsworth, Bill Anderson, and the hardworking staff at Geneseo, I'm here to run you through another ABC Wide World of Flying Warbird checkout. This is a P-40E Kitty Hawk. Through the P-40C, they were called Tomahawk. The D's and E's were Kitty Hawks. And then with the P-40F and subsequent models, it was changed to Warhawk. As with all the other World War II fighters, the two essentials to flying one remain the same. Mastery of the AT-6 trainer and the pilot's handbook. This is particularly true of the P-40, since it's a much more squirrely airplane on the ground than most others. And it has a host of 1930 systems that are quite complex to operate. It also helps to do a thorough pre-flight. The cockpit's very roomy, particularly compared to the P-51, though the knobs and levers are pure 1940s Ford. They are laid out logically and not too hard to follow. So let's go from left to right on a pre-start checklist. And we'll get started. First check the flaps in neutral. The gear control handle in neutral and the locking pin in. Rudder trim set to two and a half degrees right. Takeoff setting on the elevator trim. Throttle and idle, mixture and idle cutoff, propeller full forward. Fuel selector handle on fuselage tank because about 10 gallons an hour feeds it back into the fuselage tank in flight, so you want to burn that first. Propeller circuit breaker on, and propeller switch in auto. Mags off, aileron trim in neutral, carburetor heat in cold. Hydraulic hand pump set on the manual position and not on emergency. And the cooling gills or the cowl flaps in full open. If either the gear or the flaps fail to come down with the electric motor or the manual hand pump, you can take the manual pump handle, transfer it to the emergency pump system, open these two 1930s garden hose handles, one on the right and one on the left, and pump. You'll get the main gear only, no tail wheel, no flaps but all you'll get on landing is maybe some sheet metal damage in the tail. Works quite well. Now, starting the Kitty Hawk involves just the right amount of prime. Otherwise, you can get into some real problems. As you might remember from the P-51 checkout, you have a direct crank, and you crank it over, and if you get a stack fire, you keep cranking. In this, you don't have that. All you've got is an inertial flywheel. You spin the thing up, oh, usually about 25 seconds. Then you push to engage, and it spins itself down, and just when you don't think it's going to fire, it, it'll, it'll fire. If you've over-primed and you've run out of flywheel and you get a stack fire, you've got 30 seconds again to come back up to speed to start it. So you can be in serious trouble with a stack fire. So three shots of prime when it's cold, about one shot when it's warm. Spin up, get it, and as soon as it fires, jam the mixture forward and use the prime to keep it going. 
Now, I haven't ever had a stack fire in one of these yet, but if I, if I did, it would be a serious problem. So that's the only thing you've really got to look at. Okay, we're all set. Battery on. Mags to both. Fuel boost pump on. We'll get a couple of shots of prime here. With the boost pump on, and the boost pump off, otherwise it over floods it. Okay, energizing. We'll get the flywheel spun up, and she should start right up. So let's see what we got. Here we go. Engage. One, two, three. Start, baby. There she goes, and we keep her running with a prime. And she starts like a champ. Wonderful. Now we lock the primer, get the boost pump back on to keep it running, and use 8 million hands in the process. Okay. Don't want to waste any time getting to the runway, because this coolant will heat up real fast. Apply the power and start moving out. because this, the brakes are very sensitive and you can nose this airplane over. So you don't want to use brakes unless you can help it. You also have a very small tail wheel. It's a donut, but we call it donut tail wheel. And uh, it folds under the rim if you apply too much pressure to it. And when that happens, of course, you aren't going to get any steering. It tends to skip out of itself. And you can actually end up skipping the tail across the runway and get no steering. So you got to be careful with it. It also fights your feet back. It's really tough on the feet. You need a lot of leg muscle to move this. So you S-turn. There's no visibility over the nose compared to a Mustang. Mustang's much better. You have a big carburetor scoop on top of the cowling, so you've got to look around. Look each side. Of course, you've got these big side panels on the canopy, the forward canopy, the forward windshield, and it is wonderful. You can really look around the airplane that way. Of course, it's open canopy. You can look forward. The manual does call for takeoff with the canopy open. Now, it is a banshee, let me tell you. This thing goes down. It feels like being dragged down the runway by your heels backwards. It's awful the first couple of times you do it. You just got to believe it. So we turn around into the wind for the run-up, and we're going to want to do that pretty quick because coolant gets hot real fast. We're already at the top of the green, and you can see we haven't taxied very far. So we're up to 2,300 RPM. Check the mags. Check the props. Go to decrease. Go to increase. Bring her back up. And flick her back into auto. Boost pump on. Mixture is in auto rich. Trims are set. Gas on the fuselage tank because it feeds about 10 gallons an hour back in the fuselage. You don't want that to vent overboard. Okay, we're all set. Here we go. Power up. And she really starts to go here. You need a lot of right foot. Foot goes down up to 45 inches of manifold pressure. Let the tail fly up or you'll have too much torque on takeoff. Here we go. Four off at about 100. She comes right up. Bring the power back and the gear up. Power back to 2,500 RPM and 35 inches. Okay, looking good. We got a hydraulic pressure highlight. Let's see. We can't be forward now and get the heck out of this wind. Okay. Whew. As you can see, a lot goes on on takeoff, so you really have to be careful. So at 2,500 RPM and 35 inches, we'll go ahead and climb up. Do some maneuvering. Airplane is a good maneuvering airplane. It's uh, much more maneuverable than a Mustang. A Mustang is locked in cement compared to this thing. This is a lot like a Pitts with an Allison engine on the front. Wonderful ailerons. First time I did an aileron roll on this thing, I hit my head on both sides of the canopy because I was used to the Mustang, so I did a, a full deflection roll. Holy mackerel, that thing really got a hold of me. Now I'll dial some of the rudder trim out because we don't need it, so I'm dialing it back down to about a degree and a half. That's about all we're going to need. Everything stabilized. You double check the, the gear being up and locked by trying to move the hydraulic hand pump. If it's very stiff, you've got it up. 
course, you check the indicators, but you can't really believe those all the time. Okay, we'll try a few uh, stalls when we get up here. We get up to 3,000 feet. This is a very docile airplane. There's very little you've got to worry about as far as the airplane being a severe airplane to stall. It does say, though, spins are prohibited. They are prohibited in the manual. Okay. So we'll power back. We'll put the gear and the flaps down again. Pull the detent out of the gear handle, put it down, push the power button, and then the gear comes down. And again, you get the indication is full down when you get the hydraulic pressure on light. That tells you that it's stiff and everything is down. Then you put it back in neutral and test the hydraulic hand pump to make sure it is down. Now you gotta have these levers back in neutral whenever you use them. So you've got to get the gear down or up and then put it back in neutral. That holds the fluid in the system and locks the gear. There, that is the down lock and the up lock for that matter. Okay, here we go, get the nose up for a stall, a dirty stall. It's pretty gentle, but like any airplane of this nature, World War II type, you've got to have the ball centered. If you don't have the ball centered at the turn and bank, she will spin, and it's and the, and the manual says they're very violent. And there it goes, okay. Nice stall, nice clean break, no problem at all. Feed the power back in. Get the nose trim back down. Double check the, the gear being up and locked. Okay, now we'll try some maneuvering. And I'll show you this. You can see how quick this, this aileron goes. I'll wham it over to the left and then back to the right. And you can see it is very quick. I'm not applying full deflection on it by any means. Okay, we'll get the nose down for a roll. It does a very nice roll, very nice indeed. As I mentioned before, 200 miles an hour is plenty. We'll bring the nose up and we'll just let her go around. And she goes around like a champ, as you can see, just a beautiful thing. Absolutely no trouble at all. Okay, we'll get the nose down for a roll. Clear the area, make sure there's nobody out here with us. Looks good. Okay, nose down. And you don't need full deflection. I've got uh, 220 miles an hour, that's plenty. Up she goes, and let her go around, and she goes around like a bandit. All you gotta do is hold it in, and it's just a beautiful rolling airplane. After years of reading that the B-40 couldn't maneuver, particularly with the Zero, I'd come to accept the general opinion that it was outclassed by almost everything else flying. Sitting here in the cockpit with the controls in my hands, having written a book about the aircraft and having said all those things, the accepted history just isn't accurate. No question it didn't have the top speed and high altitude performance of later fighters, but it did have the best maneuverability of the American fighters. And many pilots, particularly in China, preferred it over the Mustang. And it could certainly make diving, slashing attacks as few fighters we had. All I have to do is shove the nose down and I can hit 400 miles an hour in short order. The drawback to all this speed is having to virtually stand on the left rudder to keep the ball centered. Every power and speed change brings an immediate trim change. It could be a real handful in a dive or a loop. For extended crews, the V-1710 burns around 48 gallons an hour. With 148 gallons internal and 75 in the drop tank, that's sure longer than I'd ever want to sit in one. Okay, there's Geneseo. So let's head on back. We'll do a 360 degree overhead break for landing. And when you put the nose down on this thing, you can have 400 miles an hour very quickly. I can see why Claire Chennault and his guys are able to do so well. 
because it will dive. It doesn't have a great top speed, but it will dive. Geneseo Unicom, this is P40, zero off for kilo, entering uh, initial overhead brake for runway 23. Okay, I'm just carrying cruise power on the way down. I'm already at 250 miles an hour. So you got to manage your speed. you got to be careful. Over the runway. Turning in for initial. That is delightful to handle. It doesn't lock up too bad at uh, this speed. At 300 it gets kind of heavy. But this isn't too bad.
down to the bottom, battery off, and mags off. And we're all set. The P-40 can really bite you if you aren't sharp, particularly on landing. But each time I sit in this cockpit, sweating up a storm with my legs jumping from overwork and adrenaline, I bask in the experience of having flown an airplane and not simply having driven one like a car. That's what continues to attract me to these great warbirds of the past, flown by pilots who will remain among the finest ever. To have been a part of that, even though it's been so many decades ago, and is but a shadow of the actual combat with its horrible realities, makes me thankful for such men and women. There will never be another breed quite like them.